getting us to this place. Order our steps, Lord. Order our steps so that we can walk through the open doors in this season. Bridle our tongues, Lord. Let our words edify. Lord, let the words of our mouth be acceptable in your sight. Take charge, Lord, of my thoughts both day and night, just order our steps in your word. Father, as I stand before your people, I ask that you speak on my behalf. I don't want anything that I say or do to get in the way of you. So Lord, hide me behind the cross so that I speak. I will speak and you will show yourself and that your people will see Jesus. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our heart be acceptable in your sight. You are our strength and redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. As you remain standing, turn to Luke chapter 1. We're going to read verses 19 and 20. Due to the limitations we have in time, but at your leisure, I want you to read the entire chapter. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and whole, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a First chapter, verse 19 and 20. I'll be reading from the King James Version, so what I read may differ from what you have, but, but if you read silently as I read aloud, we'll get greater understanding. Again, you read the entire chapter at your leisure, and we're going to focus on just these two verses here, 19 and 20. And the word of the Lord says, And the angel answered, say, answering said unto him, I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God, and I'm sent to speak unto you and show you these glad tidings. And behold, somebody say behold. behold. Thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed. Because thou believest not my word, which shall be fulfilled in their season. I want to tag this text with this topic. With these open doors, watch your mouth. Watch your mouth. Just tell your neighbor, watch your mouth. Watch your mouth. Uh, if somebody got missed on that one, tell someone else, say, you need to watch your mouth. You, watch your mouth. you may be seated in the presence of God in this assembly. Just to set context, I want to at least try to paint the picture and, and, and connect the dots. Um, we had... Uh, a word from the Lord given to us at the end of 2023, and it was introduced to us um, on the last and first Sunday of 2023 and 2024. And the Lord said, based on Revelation chapter 3, verse 8 and 9, I know your works. I have set before you an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast little strength and hast kept my word and has not denied my name. Behold, I will make them the synagogues of Satan, which say, you are Jews, say they are Jews and are not but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. In a sense, we need to understand that an open door is an opportunity from God. Uh, let me help you to understand something. If we understand the context of God's opportunities, we will learn that everything that we encounter is an opportunity. Yes, now, the problem isn't in the opportunity. It's in the eye of the perceiver. 
Many of us perceive things to be obstacles when they're actually opportunities. And so if we start looking at everything through the eye of God, all things are working for our good. We see everything as an opportunity. And so in part one, I told you that you need to expect open doors, expect opportunities, be aware of open doors, look for them, watch for God's hand on the door, because some, all opportunities are not necessarily God's opportunity. Some opportunities are designed to get you off course. We have an opportunity to eat dessert every time we go out, but that we know that's not God. I thought I was in a church that could relate. And be thankful for open doors. On part two, we finished up on last week. The question was posed, what should I do in times of heavy opposition to see the opportunities instead of the enemy? Because many of us, when we encounter enemies, we immediately say, oh my goodness, everything is falling apart. But the reality is, even when the enemy's there, God is there as well. And so the first thing we ask you to do is reject self-proclaimed messages of defeat. Stop claiming defeat and start claiming yourself as victor. And then resist settling in fear, because we like to rest in somebody's trying to get me. And rest in God to get uh, sight before your problem. Now, in this particular text today, we meet a man by the name of Zacharias who is being instructed, uh, he's being introduced as a descendant of Aaron. How do I know this? Because when I look at the text, I see a word that brings me to the lineage of Aaron. Uh, and it talks about where he's from, it, uh, the course of, and it helps us to understand that he came into this lineage in the days of David when David's time uh, 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 was, was present. The family of Aaron was being multiplied quite a bit. And so David then took the family of Aaron. If you don't know who Aaron is, Aaron is the first high priest of Israel. And so a, uh, David took the descendants of, of Aaron and he divided them into 24 courses um, for more regular performance in the office that, may, um, may ne- that it may never be neglected and that they will never have a problem with putting hands to the plow. Now, I understand that because sometimes in church work, You don't have enough workers for the work that we're trying to do, but we have plenty of people expecting to receive from the work. David being king, he divided the family of, 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 uh, of Aaron in order to fill the work in the temple. And so we have eight of those being, uh, that of the course, Abia. And we find that in first Chronicles 24 and 10, who was the descendants of Eleazar, Aaron's eldest son. And so Zechariah and his wife were descendants of that line of people, the priestly generation of Israel. And according to the text, they have been praying concerning their barren state. They have been married but had not had any children. And so they have been praying about that. They've been praying about it a long time, and they finally get to the point of being settled in, God ain't going to give us no kids. They're older, they're chilling, and they're just doing their thing, and they forgot that they prayed. But watch me now. God sends a message from the throne of heaven to say, I heard your prayers. Now I'm about to do something big in your life. Can I park parenthetically there? Because I need some of you to know that you've been praying about some things, and God is sending a message to you right now. Don't you give up on what you've asked God for because God is not the kind of father that will give you a serpent when you ask for fish. Here I am. We got to learn how to wait on God. And so here it is. Zechariah is chilling, doing his duties. Then God sends an angel. And this angel is Gabriel. He's dispatched by God to announce that God would provide divine intervention and give them a son, an open door. Now watch this. The power in this revelation is that God not only met their desires, but he was also going to explain how big this thing was going to be. And he explains that your son is not just going to be a son, but he's going to be a bad mama jamma. He's going to be a forerunner for Jesus. And I I cannot park there too because we need to understand that when God blesses us, 
It is a forerunner for Jesus. When God does a great thing in your life, it is so that you can testify that if it had not been for the Lord on... Oh, y'all know about that too. I don't know where I'd be. So it seems that although Zacharias had been praying about a son, he forgot that old church slogan. He may not come when you want him, but it's always... Oh, y'all heard about that. So Zechariah, instead of celebrating the news, that he, he thought about his condition. He was like, wait a minute, you're going to hook me up now? I'm an old man. And I know my wife, I, I've been with her. I know she, I mean, it ain't nothing going to happen here. And so he had already settled into his state. Now, this kind of upset Gabriel. Gabriel said, Gabriel responded to his question by saying, Wait a minute, what's my name? I'm Gabriel, and I just came to you from the throne of God. You don't need to ask me how, you just need to ask me when. And so Gabriel says, because you've been running your mouth, doubting that God is going to move on your behalf, you won't be able to talk. And in a real sense, I believe Gabriel is standing here today speaking through me and telling us that if you don't learn how to shut your mouth, you might mess up what God is about to do in your life. Now, there are a lot of things that frame the way we think. We got to learn how to not think according to the things that we see, but think according to the word of God. Why was Zechariah struggling with this open door? Was it because he was settled in, in, in disappointment? And are you settled in a place of disappointment where you had expectations in life, but instead of moving toward what you've expected, you've settled into, I'll never get there. Maybe he he given up on his ability uh, to walk in the proclaimed miracles of God. And I believe that many of us, because we're not walking in miracles every day, or at least not recognizing the miracles that we walk in, we are missing out on the proclaimed miracles of God. I realize that every time I take a breath, that is a miracle. So now my eyes is always on the possibilities. Because if the truth be told, when I was a kid, I got ran over by a car. I really shouldn't be here, but... I'm still here, and every day I take a breath, I'm a miracle. I'm a miracle. Maybe, maybe he didn't uh, take the words, maybe he took, didn't take the words of the angel into consideration, but rather the words of others who had been around him in consideration. Now, have you ever tried to do something but only considered what your naysayer said? It's possible that he, he was programmed into not having so much that he decided that he would never have. And many of us, we are broke today because we're programmed at being broke. We're in despair today because we're programmed to be in despair. But how many of you know that when God is on your side, no situation that you're in is a place of destination or resignation. It is a place of transformation because every place I'm in, I'm always looking to what God said. God said to me, I know the thoughts I think towards you said the Lord. Oh, this is a quiet church. Let me talk to the musicians. The Bible says that I know the plans I have for you said the Lord. Oh, they quiet too, so let me go over here and try to preach it. I know the thoughts that I think about you, and it has a purpose beyond where you are. Did he miss the purpose of miracles in the life? So in the text, it appears that he spoke according to what he saw. Luke 1.18 says, and Zechariah said unto the angel, whereby shall I know this? For I'm an old man. And my wife is well stricken in you. I wonder why she, wonder why he said that like that about his wife. He said, I'm an old man. But then he said about his wife, she's stricken. <laughs> she's stricken in you. Okay, I won't go there. All right. So let me, let me, can I, let me deal with this from the perspective of kingdom principles. Although a priest seems, uh, although, although he was a priest, it seemed like he was missing on what kingdom principle need to be operating in his life. He forgot that Genesis 1, 26 says, let, man, let us create man in our image and in our likeness and let them have dominion over everything that creepeth on the earth. 
So he forgot that he was a man of dominion. Maybe he forgot that in Genesis 2.19, the Lord said, and out of the ground the Lord formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And the reason he brought them was he wanted to make sure that what he knew, Adam would speak. And because he spoke what God knew, everything that was in the earth became what it is today. And you have the same kind of authority that if you start speaking according to God's knowledge, whatever is done in heaven is going to manifest in the earth. That's a kingdom principle. But at the same time, there's some other things that we're agreeing, agreeing with that comes from hell instead of heaven. And whatever is coming into our heart, if we meditate on that thing, that's what it's going to be. That's why Proverbs 18, 20, 21 says, a man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his what? And with the increase of his lips shall he be filled. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. In other words, everybody sitting here today, you have what you've been declaring. Pastor, I'm so sick. Yep, you are. Pastor, I can't do it. Nope, you can't. Pastor, I can make this happen. Yes, you can. Whatever you are declaring on a consistent basis, that is what you're eating in your life. And there's some women in here that's still single because that's what you've been saying. There's some married folk in here that's miserable because that's what you've been saying. There's some miserable folk that are miserable because that's what you've been saying. There's some loners in here because you're, you're lonely because that's what you've been saying. You will have the fruit of your mouth. So, if I know that this is a kingdom principle, I also need to know what's going on in the airwaves that's going to program my thinking. So, I look at Ephesians 2 and 2, and here's what it says. Wherein in time past... Ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So in a sense, the children of disobedience, which are the children of the devil, are setting in motion words of thought in the atmosphere. And when you allow those things to program your thinking, you start declaring things that are designed to destroy you instead of what God said about you. Have you ever noticed that the world keeps us separating? We try to identify what color we are, what culture we are, what, what religion we are. We are keep continuously separating because the devil knows that if he can divide, he can conquer. But how many of you know that the moment we stop looking at the devil's plan and start looking at God's plan, we're going to start working some things out. So now that I know these things, how should I respond? Ephesians 6 and 11 says, put on the whole arm of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. That word wiles, it means tricks. And there is some tricks going on in here. Silly rabbit tricks are for kids and not for men and women of God. We are standing by faith in what God says about us. As long as you know what God said, you can resist the tricks of the enemy the real tricks of the the tricks that we can fight against is uh, the lack of faith. When we lack faith, we can't resist things. If I don't believe that God said something about me, if I don't believe what God said about me, I will be tricked into things that God did not say about me. And so, my antithesis today, I need to question you. How many of you today are here and you've been praying about something but allowing your perceived obstacles and your unfulfilled past to keep you from seeing the doors of opportunity that God has put in your life. Giving up on your vision. Giving up on your dreams. Giving up on education. Giving up on a business. Quit the church. Giving up on the church. Giving up on your family. Giving up on love. Giving up on marriage. I believe that I am a messenger from God today that has been sent to tell you that you don't have to stay in the shape that you're in because God is ready to put us back together. So get ready, get ready, get ready. God is about to do something in your life as long as you let your mind line up with what God is doing. So get ready. It's coming because God is going to get the glory. Get ready. It's coming. 
is going to serve as a forerunner to a testimony of Jesus Christ. Get ready. It's coming because your miracle is going to convince others to try Jesus. I know you hear the declaration, but I'm here wondering if any of you are victims of your own mouth. I, I, I really want to know is if you're miserable because of your words. I want to know if you had a thought that came from God, but you nullified that thought with words from your mouth. And so here's my thought. When we are in Christ, our newness brings opportunities that aligns with the kingdom purpose and supersedes worldly logic. Uh, that, that Y'all missed that. Y'all looking at me. What does that mean? In other words, the world got its plan and it, the world got its systems. But when you're in Christ, the connection to Christ supersedes all worldly systems that exist in your life. You don't have to be miserable because of where you are because you know where you're going. You don't have to be stuck where you are because you know where you're going. You don't get distracted by folk who are in the alley of failure because you're not going to the alley of failure. You're going through the alley of failure. You are going somewhere. Tell someone near you, I'm going somewhere. I can't stay where I am. I won't think about it. I won't plan on it. I'm going somewhere. No, no, no. You need to write it down. You need to take some notes. You need to send yourself a message. You need to text yourself and just say to yourself, I'm going somewhere. I, I, I can't stay like this. I, I can't stay in this condition. I'm being transformed. I'm being renewed every single day. Because if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passing away. Behold. All things. I'm not the way I used to be, and I'm not going to be the way I am. I'm going somewhere. Oh, you clocking out on me? Don't worry about it. I'm going somewhere. Somebody else is going to clock in. Oh, you don't want to be with, around me? Don't worry about it. I'm going somewhere. You can't keep up anyway. All right. So I got nine minutes to tell you this. How do I stop my mouth? from messing with my promise. How do I stop my mouth from messing with my potential? How do I stop my mouth from messing with God's plan? Here's what you got to do. Write this down. Text it to somebody. Post it on your Facebook page. Tweet it on X, whatever that thing is. It switched from Twitter to X. I don't know what that means. Keep your mind on what God is saying, not on what you know. This is, a, this, 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 this is a message by itself. Keep your mind on what the Word says. We're just saying, order my steps. Keep your mind on what you're just saying. You, wanna order, you want him to order your steps. Keep your mind on the Word. Right now, 25% of you are going to get this, and 75% of you are going to walk away and just leave it on the table. But this is a message that's going to change your life forever. If you ever learn to keep your mind on what the Word says and not on what you see, because what you see will keep you stuck, but what the Word says will propel you forward. Zechariah said in 118, Zechariah said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am old, <laughs> and my wife is stricken in years. I just got to do that thing. <laughs> Any of you in here stricken? <laughs> And if you hear old, and some of us may be young, but old in the mind, we've been where we have been for a long time, so we see no hope. And so as soon as Gabriel told Zacharias of the impossible thing God was going to do in his life, Zechariah focused on what was not possible, why it was not possible. In verse 18, Zechariah said, how will I know this? But then explains why it couldn't be possible. Now, have you ever explained away a miracle where the word says one thing, but you didn't focus on Jesus. You just focused on what you thought it could not be. God says one thing, and then we, we say another. I've heard people say to me, well, that's what the Bible says, but reality says. I said, then that's why you're stuck. 
because you're stuck in reality. When God made you a creator, he made you in his image, which means that we don't start from where we are. We start from what we see. And so if you are trying to start a business, you don't start a business from being broke. You start a business from a vision. This is why many of us are stuck. We have no vision for our lives. So we're perishing because we're not operating by the design of God that God made us to create and cultivate. So it's not just speaking it and claiming it. It's speaking, claiming, and working. I got a sweatshirt that says good things come to those who hustle and pray. In other words, you got to learn how to work towards what you believe God for because faith without works means that your faith is dead. God says, you are fearfully and wonderfully made, but you say, I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody about somebody who can save anybody. God says that by his stripes you are healed from the penalty of sin, but you're saying, I'm just sick in my body. God called you the head, but you're saying, it's hard to get ahead. God sent a word saying you can do all things in Christ. We're saying that all the things that we need to do is too hard for us. I need three people in here who believe that, that if God said it, it can be done. I, 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 I want somebody here who believes that God can do anything in our life. God can save me. God can lift me up. God can strengthen me. And God can raise me up. That's why I like to look at myself as... Uh, Y'all know I like debate. Y'all haven't heard this before, but I got to tell you this story. I had some, uh, I, was, I was challenged by somebody. They said, Bishop, I bet you can't cook a carrot cake. I said, the devil is a liar. I can cook anything that you put before me. So I took on the challenge. And I put all the ingredients together. While doing it, that carrot cake started talking to me. I said, oh, goodness, the church going to think I'm hallucinating. But the cake talked to me, I'm telling you. When I was, when I was raping, raking down the carrots, the carrot says, you notice this is how the world will treat you because you're a believer. It will shred you to pieces. Then the carrot said, but I got a word for you, Bishop. I said, what's your word, carrot? Because it got my attention. He says that blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all oh, manner of evil against you falsely. For my sake, in other words, we ought to rejoice when folk try to tear us apart. Uh, I said, that's good, carrot. But then I put the carrot in the batter. I started mixing things together. While I was mixing things together, the, the, the batter started singing to me. I couldn't believe it. I didn't know batter could have church. The batter said, I've had some good days. I've had some weary nights. I've had some weary days. And lonely nights, but when I look around, I say, I'm stirring you around, and I think things over. All of my good days. Somebody here, did you, I, did, Bishop, I don't believe the batter said that. Yes, it did. And I separated the batter, put it in the oven. And this way I got my shout. The batter said, Come look at me. I said, No, I can't look. I can't look. Got 20 minutes to cook. No, he said, Come look at me. I said, I can't look. You got 20 minutes to go. He said, boy, come look at me. I said, yes, sir. And I looked into the stove, and I noticed that although the batter was split into three pans, sitting in a cake, in an oven that was heated to a good temperature, the batter started singing a song, I rise. I said, what you talking about? He said, I rise. I said, what you talking about? The batter says, when the tough gets going, I rise. When the heat is on, I rise. What, what, what does that have to do with me, batter? The batter said, when you are in Christ and you go through tough moments, all of that toughness is working for you. And because you are in Christ, you rise above your situation. You rise above your haters. You rise above your problems. You rise above your perception. You rise. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody here need to tell your neighbor, I'm rising. So when my opportunity comes, I'm walking through that door. All right. I, 
I, I rose right past my time. We're going to come back next week. We're going to finish this thing. But I need you to know that our mind is where the limitation comes. God has created you without limits. The only real limitation you have is the ones that you allow to keep you down. But somebody here need to say, I may not have understand anything Bishop said today, but I'm going to rise above those haters that are in my life. I'm going to rise above those people who say that I can because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And if my Jesus took death, and uh, if he took nails in his hands, if my Jesus was nailed down to a cross, if my Jesus was lifted high and stretched wide, I know I can make it. If my Jesus hung his head and died for my sin, if my Jesus was put in a borrowed tomb, if my Jesus got up on the third day with all power in his hand, I can rise too. Because if I'm in him, I will rise with him. You need to tell yourself, I'm better than what I'm going through. I'm better than the challenges that I have in my life. I'm better than the way I've been thinking. I am much better. I hear this song. Never would have made it. Never could have made it without you. I would have lost it all. But now I see you and there for me. I need to minister to someone here. You are in a place of despair. But God says that what you're going through is not your destination. It's just your journey. And you feel like you're about to lose everything, but God said, not so. He's going to command your steps. He's going to order your steps. Now I see you've been there for me. I'm stronger. I'm wiser. <laughs> I'm better. Much better. When I look, and all he's brought me through I realize that it was you I held on to can somebody say this with me oh I never never would have made somebody here got that testimony oh never never could have made it without you I would have lost it all but now I see how you were there for me. If you're here with us today and you're a baptized believer, we welcome you to celebrate the Lord's Supper with us today. Now, in celebrating the Lord's Supper, here's what we're doing. We're recognizing that we're entering into communion of suffering with Christ. It means that we are no longer going to be controlled by our atmospheres because we're more like thermostats. We change our atmosphere because we are not controlled by anything we go through. The Bible says, for I reckon that these light afflictions are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. There's a greater glory for every trial, every tribulation that you go through. Somebody need to claim that I've got a greater glory coming to me. So if the Bible also says that if you confess your sins, God is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. We don't take the Lord's Supper unworthy but because we're believers we know that confession makes us worthy being whole away from sin is not a feeling it is a work that Jesus fulfilled and even though you confess you may still feel like that sinner God has taken that stuff away from you by the power of Jesus Christ so I want you to pause for a moment and ask God to forgive you for your sins the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And you don't need to go before a priest. You can go directly to the high priest, Jesus Christ. So I want you to just ask the Lord to forgive you now.
Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you now representing these people. I ask now that you forgive us for any sin that we've committed, knowingly or unknowingly. Whatever sin are at our feet, I ask that you forgive us. Your word says that if we confess it, you're faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So clean us, Lord, so that we will not reside in the place of sin that we have been in. We ask all these blessings. We ask that you bless us bread and wine as we partake. In Jesus' name, amen.